Okay. So first of all, we're going to be hearing from Dorian Princey. Dorian works as a preschool field officer at Moreland City Council. And in this role, she works with state funded kindergartens to support the access and participation of children with additional needs. And, Hi. Uh, also, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Dorian, something popped up okay. and um, yeah. Uh, so Dorian also assists with linking families into services available to support their needs. So I'll let uh, Dorian introduce herself further and we'll hear from her. Thank you so much, Dorian. Over to you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Nazish, and thank you everyone for having me tonight. Um, as Nazish said, my name's Dorian and I'm one of the preschool field officers working in Moreland. And I'm really excited to be here and looking forward to contributing to the preparing for school conversation. It's an exciting time in yours and your child's um, journey through life as they transition to school. And it's really lovely to have the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, as a preschool field officer, as Nazish mentioned, I do, I work with state funded kindergarten programs, both in long daycare integrated programs and sessional programs. My role consists of offering consultative support, resourcing, and practical advice to kindergarten teachers, as well as assisting kindergartens to link families into supports and services available for children with developmental concerns and broader child health and family supports. I work with um, a variety of, lots of different kindergartens in Moreland. We've got 70 plus programs in total in Moreland, again, both in integrated and sessional settings, all in different shapes and sizes, but all kindergartens um, teaching the skills needed to support your child's life readiness. Um, no matter where your child attends kindergarten, they'll be learning through play with an early childhood teacher where the research shows us that play-based learning is the best way to help young children learn, de learn, develop well and prepare to thrive at school. But also I think it's so much, um, school is a, a step, a stepping stone and it's, it's, all, it's about life readiness as well, which is really valuable and important. So as you can see in the slide, I'm just highlighting some of the areas of learning that happen within a kindergarten program. And, um, as I mentioned, it's consistent throughout all programs, um, despite whether it's an integrated program or a sessional program, um, two rooms, one room. So next slide, please, Kat. So I'll just get myself organized. So um, this slide sort of looks at focusing on your um, the kindergarten teachers as the experts in early childhood education and development and um, how they are best placed to give advice and link you into different services and supports. Your child's kindergarten teacher has a bachelor degree qualification in early childhood education, and they're a great support to be able to offer expert advice when it comes to early childhood education, development, school readiness, and also with community supports services and, and different resources. In my role as a preschool food officer, I, I have the privilege of working with some amazing teachers within Moreland. And when I'm supporting teachers' conversations with families around school readiness, I really like to highlight that their child's kindergarten teacher has, has a, a real, they're in a really privileged position because they get to see their child in a social setting away from significant others. And they'll be able to share some really valuable information towards school readiness conversations and in relation to other supports for your child. So I guess um, it really is so valuable in working in partnership with your child's kindergarten teacher to support your child's life journey. Um, um, amongst many of them is the school readiness journey as well. Next slide, please, Kat. So in Moreland, we, um, we value partnerships and starting school is a major life transition for both children and their families, both challenging and exciting at the same time. Effective and positive transitions supports and continue, um, supports the continuity of the child's learning and development, recognizing um, that building on children's prior and current experiences helps them to feel secure, confident, and connected to um, people, places, events, and routines, people, places, events, routines, and understanding. Promoting continuity of learning and development requires um, strong partnership and a, a strong partnership approach between not just um, kindergarten teachers and primary school teachers, but also between kindergarten teachers, primary school teachers and families to support um, children 
previous experiences and um, support them with the new challenges and opportunities presented when a child moves on to, on to primary school. In Moreland, um, there are lots of amazing partnerships happening within those areas. And we like to support these partnerships um, between kindergarten and primary schools through what we call the Moreland Transition Network. And at Transition Network meetings, teachers and service providers are given um, the opportunity to come together to network and to build on these relationships, promoting that collaboration for the benefit of the children and families, as well as um, for shared professional learning opportunities. The picture in the slide is um, a picture of a, a transition network meeting online. Unfortunately, um, since the transition network began, it has all been online, but despite that, there's still been some really valuable connections made where teachers and service providers are coming together and supporting to tailor your child's transition to school so that it's not just a cookie cutter experience and we're really trying to build on those partnerships and as um, as a team the Moreland team and the Ready Set Prep team partner together to support these networks with teachers and service providers. Thanks Kat, next slide please. So the benefits of play-based learning. Um, I mentioned play-based learning earlier at, um, in this presentation. Um, when children play, they are working on developing their brains. It's as simple as that. Children learn through play. And as they play, they are shaping their, shaping their developing, like, developing brain, pardon me. Play encourages exploration, problem solving, discovery, social and emotional skills, vocabulary development and literacy and numeracy development. And supporting um, supporting the development of life skills as they that they will take with them not just to school but to school and beyond as they enter into high school and then through to the workforce. It's through play-based learning. Sorry, cat, back to that one still. <laughs> it's through play-based learning that children are supported to develop a lifelong love of learning, where the learning taking place is meaningful to the child. So when we're um, when children are, in, just like I guess with adults as well, when we're engaging in something that's meaningful to us, it has more of an impact, it, it means more, it, it, we remember it clearer. So when children are engaging in meaningful play, it gives, um, it gives children a choice about what he or she wants to do. It feels fun and enjoyable. It involves continuity um, rather than giving children a script to follow and having that sort of rote learning. It's driven by intrinsic motivation about what the child wants to do. It creates a risk-free environment where children can experiment and try new ideas. It supports success as there is no right or wrong way and the child explores and engages in the play as they see fit. Um, in meaningful play, children are active participants in their learning. They're um, at the centre of it. And I might also um, extend on, if you can see in the slide, amongst some of the um, play um, choices that children might have presented to them at home and at kindergarten. I've got reality play and I just wanted to highlight this as a, a play where children engage in real life experiences and activities to support and keep growing their brain. And this includes things like helping with dinner, weeding the garden, helping with the dishes, folding the washing and so on. So children love to engage in real materials that produce um, real life results. So I think it's just lovely to highlight this because um, these things don't cost a lot of money and it's easy and the benefits are huge and you can also um, rest assured that you're not um, as well as supporting around the house children are, are benefiting and growing their brains while they're doing some house chores as well <laughs> next slide please Kat so this slide um, talks about um, the heart language and I heard the term heart language from a colleague of mine who's a speech therapist and I really loved that terminology in relation to supporting your child's home language and um, there are multiple studies um, that have shown that when bilingual learners have a high, um, high quality interactions in both their home language and English they can successfully become bilingual which carries significant advantages in cognitive social, emotional, linguistic areas of brain development. If, if you have a language other than English, um, I just, I guess we just wanted to highlight how important it is for you and your family to keep using your home language, that, that heart language at home. When your child is learning Eng English, um, you know, why, why is it important? I think um, 
there are so many values and some of them include, you know, if your child, if your children have a good skills in their home language, it will help them to have good language skills in English. It helps children to have a strong connection to your family, your culture and community, and to be proud of it, which is really, really important and supports that sense of belonging um, when we look at the Victorian Early Years Learning and Development Framework. It's um, knowing more than one language helps children get ready for school and to be, to be good learners. Sometimes children start to use um, more English as they get older and don't get discouraged by this. There are lots of studies that have shown that despite this, it is good to keep using your home language, even if your child uses English to talk and, and respond back to you. I've had many conversations with parents where they um, feel that, oh, all is lost. My child's speaking back to me in English and they're not speaking um, in our home language, but definitely persist and continue to um, speak to your child in your heart language because as they continue to grow and develop, they will definitely be hearing and taking all of it on board and um, may continue to speak in their heart language as the years continue. Um, and also most importantly, your child's kindergarten and school can also support with this and engage in your child, um, engage your child in a space and place that promotes the use of your child's heart language. So doing things like you can see on this slide where we've um, put the word hello and also um, represented different languages in the set, um, to say the same word. Um, some great um, bilingual um, experiences do happen at kindergarten well as well. And again, it supports that sense of belonging for children within that kindergarten space, but also helps you out in promoting that heart language at home as well. So next slide, please, Kat. So when we um, were asked to do this presentation, we were asked for a hot tip on starting school. And this is my hot tip. And I'm glad I got to go first because perhaps um, it won't be, it may or may not be repeated, but here it goes. Um, it talks about letting your child wear their school uniform and shoes and use their school bag and, and wear their hat and use their lunchbox before they start school so that um, these items are so familiar to them before they start school. It's one less new thing they need to get used to as they enter into that school environment, as they start to experience, experience so much change. So I've you know, known some parents that will um, maintain will keep using their child's lunchbox from kindergarten. And that's the lunchbox that they will take to school again. So it's a comfort, it's something that's known to them or they'll let them wear their school uniform if there is a school uniform to kindergarten in the last um, weeks of, of, of kindergarten and using school shoes to go to the park again, just so that they get worn in and they're not so brand new. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for, um, for listening to me and I hope it's been useful. Thank you so much um, for that, Orianne. My uh, really wonderful tips and uh, strategies. I wish I could go back. Now my kids are all grown up, all of them at school, <laughs> but I could <laughs> definitely use some of those tips. Um, thanks for that. Thank you so, so next, much, Nadesh. Thank you. So next we have Rachel Marks. Rachel is a foundation teacher at Glenroy West Primary School. She's also a school leader and learning specialist with a background and passion in literacy. And thank you so much, Rachel, for joining us and look forward to hearing from you now. I'd like to hand it over to you. Perfect, Diga. Thank you so much, so much, Nazush, and Kat for the invitation. Um, look, first of all, I think the most important thing to say in a group like this is to say congratulations. Parents, you've got your child ready to start school and that is a huge huge milestone so any work that teachers are going to do is going to build off your good work as parents you will be and you will always be your child's first teacher you will always be the most important teacher um, so basically schools are just going to carry on your good work um, and continue it look um, I am a prep teacher. Again, I'm actually a third generation teacher. So I come from a family of teachers. My grandfather was a school principal. My mum taught in special education, and that is really tough. My sister's a teacher, my auntie, my uncle. So we could run this. So I could probably do the whole night and tell you a million stories but I'm gonna try and keep it really, really quick. But look, I've taught, found, I've taught for over 20, 25 years, sadly, a little bit about age. 
So, and again, I've, co I've kept coming back to foundation. Foundation, there is something really special about PrEP. So, I guess to just to give you a little bit of background so families know what to expect about that. And now the examples I'm going to give today, I'm not speaking from one school. I'm speaking on behalf of all PrEP and foundation teachers. So hopefully I'm going to use a lot of we because really I just want to reassure families it doesn't really matter where your child goes to school, whether it be a government school, an independent school, a Catholic school, an Islamic you know, school as well. If they're going to be learning the same sorts of things. They might be doing it in a slightly different colour uniform, but they're going to be learning the same sorts of things. I guess too, just to talk a little bit about, this is the second year that we've come through the COVID and COVID has really impacted education. And for the children about to start school, they've had many, uh, I guess too, they've had many uh, interruptions and many gaps. But I just want to reassure parents that learning doesn't just happen in the classroom, that the world is the best learner. And you think about ourselves as adults, many of our biggest lessons we haven't learned in the classroom. Some of those biggest things and some of the hardest are actually from the big wide world. So I guess to while that they have had a gap, it's about the schools, and I want to reassure um, families that it's about the schools being ready for your child and not about your child being ready for school. So, again, learning is developmental. You cannot force anyone to learn. So children will learn when they're ready, okay? It will happen out of the classroom, and your child is no different to any other child in a similar age bracket, so many children have had this interruption to formal learning. And I'm going to use that word formal because, like we said, there's a lot of learning going on in, in homes at the moment. We know that. So your child is not alone. All children are like that, all year levels and all sectors. And despite this lockdown, now if you are a believer in the data, that we are seeing in Victoria some of our very, very best learning rates across Australia, and we're seeing them now in the middle of COVID. So I guess to want to reassure, just because children aren't learning in the classroom doesn't mean they're not learning. Um, and again, when we look around the world, in Australia, we have probably the start, the earliest um, some of the earliest starting age for school. You think about some of the other countries around the world, um, some of the, you know, the countries up around Norway, they've got a, those children aren't starting school to things like seven, and yet they learn and they are getting many of the best results around there. I guess to thinking about the adventure that you're going to embark on next year with your child, I guess think it's to think about the partnership and it's working together with the school. So I guess to first of all to reassure you that prep teachers are human, we are people, and um, a lot of us are actually very nice, nice people. That and again, quite often, and when you look at a group of teachers, you can usually pick the prep teachers. You can usually pick us. Um, you can. So please be reassured that your child will have in front of them some of the very, very best teachers within the school. When they are joining school, and again, Dorian outlined that really lovely nature of early childhood, and schools are actually working in a lot, a lot different to when you and I went to school that now they're becoming a lot more early childhood and we're also learning a lot more about that play-based routine. There is something super sneaky about prep teachers that, again, we managed to do a lot of learning through a lot of play. So a lot of the time the kids won't even be aware they're learning. That's how, that's how well-practiced and sneaky we can be. So, again, regardless of where your child's going in, they're probably going to have a very structured program. It's going to start with a lot of literacy and numeracy, so a lot of reading, writing, counting in the mornings. In the afternoon, there'll be a lot more of that, that inquiry um, and, again, a lot more of that specialist. They'll do some art and some PE and those sorts of things. 
a lot of the time they will work in groups. They'll also spend some time getting instruction from the teacher. Um, and again, I think it's really interesting and I love talking with parents and I'd much prefer this to be a conversation when I could hear about the experiences people have had in schools. Sometimes it's very similar. Other times the system has changed quite dramatically to how we've got there. So again, a lot of the schools have things like buddy programs. And I know a lot of parents are very scared about sending their child out into a big playground. And again, quite often schools will have a, cer a certain area when they will say, this is where we're keeping our prep children. Can I personally attest to, that becomes, that's great to start with, that then becomes super difficult to keep the prep kids in there because they want to go and make friends with everyone and play. So there are lots of, and lots of supports. The prep year is very repetitive. So there's a lot of practice and there's a lot of going over the same things. And again, saying the same thing, I guess, to in 50 different ways. But I think it's really important that together that we have a really clear goal and focus. And the goal and focus for the prep year should be a love of learning. There's another 12 or 13 years to come so do you know what I say? Let's just develop a love of learning in prep and let's leave the rest of the work to the other years. It will come. So that's what to say. So really, I encourage parents in that way to let go of perfection. Just make sure that your child has a lot of fun. And many of us will know this, that when we are really happy and we're having a lot of fun, that is the preconditions for some great learning. Quite often, and one of the most important things I can say to a group like this is that you've got to give your children, you know, got to give children time to settle in. And having done this, like I said, I've, I've taught prep for over 10 years. I was doing a little bit of maths before. So that's in the hundreds of students that we've managed to get, that I've managed to get through. And can I just say, I've never had one student who cried all year. Never, never, ever. So that's good news. But please, and again, it usually takes term one and term two just for your child to settle into the routine. Quite often it's term three and even now that we are seeing that the lights just turn on for kids. And I was only having this conversation with a parent yesterday, yesterday about this very thing. And the parent said, you said just to wait and it would happen. And they practised and practised but weren't seeing any progress. And now they're seeing such massive, massive growth. For some children, it will take 18 months to settle into school. That's not so much about intelligence. That's more just a little bit about the processes. You line up here, then you go into class, you sit down on the carpet, the teacher talks to you, then you go back and do work at tables. You come down and you show the work. For some kids, it takes 18 months. And do you know what? That is quite okay. I guess too, so... The other thing to say is that the start of the prep year is, a, is very high emotional. It takes a lot of emotional energy. And believe you me, again, and speaking from a prep teacher, it takes a lot of emotional energy. I guarantee, again, I'm in bed before any child. I'm basically working and I'm in bed by 7 o'clock at the start of the year. So parents, please... Give your child at the start of the year a lot of rest and a lot of practice. Um, I'll give you an, uh, one example that my uh, brother has just had his elder start school this year and my brother was really, no, no tears, we've sailed it in. It's easy, you know, he's done it, it's fine. Um, and it wasn't until about week three or week four when it had just all been very emotional that he crashed and then, it had a bit of a meltdown. It was all too hard. So I guess to expect that it's okay. We'll work through it. That's natural. Let's sleep, you know, let's sleep lots of rest. I guess to the expectations and I guess to what, um, to sort of say that I guess to what the school would really like you as families to work with 
And I think probably my number one takeaway, and Dorian did get mine about the uniform. I love that. Um, my niece, my niece slipped in her uniform for a week. Like she would not get out of it a whole week. She slept in it, just would not get out of it. But mine's about independence and that is getting your child to do for themselves. And that's probably the biggest gift I think you can give your child. So please, like, get your child to do things. Um, again, even on day one, it's so interesting to watch the parents bring, come, you know, um, bringing in the bag, the parents, you know, with the water bottle. Give your child a lot of independence and start practising that now. Independence doesn't come overnight. We all know that. Um, I guess, too, the other thing to say is teach problem solving and that issues will arise and teach that to your child. And that's another gift. Oh, um, you ate your sandwich at playtime. Well, why don't you eat your play lunch at lunchtime? Teach your child how to solve those problems. If you've got no, if you've got no one to play with, oh, what could you do? Who could you see? But some of those things will also really, really help. The other one I would say is um, ask your child questions. And you have to ask really directed questions. Um, and this is a bit of a funny one too, about how their day was, because quite often you'll find, I'm, I'm having a little giggle already, is that when you ask students when they start school, how was school today? Um, and believe you me, this probably doesn't change for you know the entire 13 years of, of learning. It was okay. It was good. What did you do today? Nothing. And I think many of us have had that comment from kids. What did you do today? nothing just want to reassure parents we do something every day um so ask your child those direct questions oh what did you learn about in maths today what was the most exciting thing that happened today who helped you today what did you see when you were out in the yard if you ask a more directed question you're more likely to get a better response than that uh, nothing it was okay um and let's leave those till um, the teenage years, um, and I don't envy anyone going through that. The only other thing that I guess to I do want to say is that um, think about your child as an individual and don't compare. Um, many of us might have had an older child or we have friends with children when we want to compare, oh, my child's not as good a reader, so you know, my child can count further than the neighbour's child. That's not going to help your child. Think of your child as an individual. Um, probably one of the, the a funny story I can tell you um, and another piece of advice is um, believe half the stories um, that you're going to hear about us and in turn we will believe half the stories we hear about you because once we start school and once we have a relationship going, that there is no secrets. And again, every, your child's going to tell us absolutely everything. Um, and I've got quite a funny story. Many years ago, one of my first years teaching prep, I team taught with another teacher and it was Christmas and I got a card and I was so excited and the child had written it and I thought, oh, isn't that special? I opened it up and inside the card, it had two miss marks. You are the beast teacher. Um, and can I just say, I was so mortified. I was my face, and I said to my my colleague, and I was like, "Can you believe this? Like the beast teacher?" I was like, "I've worked really hard this year. I'm lovely. I'm funny." Um, and then my friend, the other teacher, just laughed and said, "Get the child to read you the card." And the child read it and said, "Miss Marks." You are the best teacher. So maybe I didn't teach that child um, all the right letters. So just to go along with that, please, um, through the education system, accept any advice from the teacher and from school from schools constructively and positively. There are a range of support services that weren't available when we went to school. So if you if the school is indicating that maybe your child would benefit from seeing, um, again, someone like Diane, an OT or a speech pathologist, again, don't be mortified and there's no shame in it. 
that I want to reassure you on behalf of all prep teachers, and I know that I say this, that, again, whatever the teacher is saying, it's in your child's best interest, okay? There is no shame in this. Everyone learns differently. Um, so accept any of that advice um, and those things. Talk about feelings, practice, practice, talk with your child. And I guess too, from a parent's point of view, if you maybe didn't have those great experiences at school, or if you're feeling a little bit anxious about having your child start school, totally understand and that is totally normal, but please, the child's gonna learn from you. Don't put those fears onto the child. Even if you have to fake it a little bit, tell a few lies that, you know, on a school's going to be great. Your teacher's going to be lovely. You're going to make lots of friends. Don't tell them the stories. Um, don't tell them the horror stories about school. If you are feeling upset, can I just say that is understandable? Please, I would suggest that a quick exit is the best way if you are concerned call the school, we can reassure you that your child is fine. Um, and many years ago when I was teaching, um, when I was actually coordinating and I was actually running in, um, into, I was running um, an integration and a support program in prep, I had a principal who used to um, encourage me to take this, I used to take the prep parents off, we would go off site, we would have a little um, celebration coffee together at a cafe so really reach out, support each other, you know, support each other as families through this. Um, and I just want to say, um, again, congratulations and that you are in for an absolutely amazing, amazing year in prep. Children never learn more. The, in, the growth and the amount of improvement and learning that goes on is incredible. So enjoy it. And get a book and write down all the funny things the kids are going to say These fabulous for 21st. So thank you for having me. Please, again, feel free to reach out um, and, again, ask any questions. I'm happy to support anyone through this process. Thank you so much, Rachel, for those um, practical tips and also for reassuring all the parents. Thanks so much. So next we have... Um, We've got another guess. Uh, so now to talk about the most important or another important side of starting school, the transition from kindergarten, uh, we've got Maha Mikhail. Maha has been working in early childhood service for many years and is a kinder teacher, nominated supervisor, educational leader, and a director at Glenroy Memorial Preschool. We are really um, uh, excited to have you, Maha, and I'll pass it over to you now um, to share your thoughts. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Nazish, for this um, chance to talk to the families about um, the kindergarten program that we have at Glenroy. It's not just Glenroy Memorial Preschool. Uh, all the kindergartens work and the long daycares work under the same regulations, under the same law, and under the same framework and the standards. So what we do at my kinder, all other kinders and other long daycares, they do it as well. So in our kinder, what we do is we teach your child what you already taught your child at home. As Rachel mentioned, and as Dorian mentioned, you are the first teacher in your child's life. You're the one who taught your child to walk, to crawl, to hold the spoon and eat, to drink some water, to go to the toilet, to wash their hands, to put their pajamas on. So you already taught your child that. So we take your child and we enhance these skills. We add to it, the same as what the schools do as well. We add to your child's skills. We take your child, your child is here, and we take it to there. It doesn't matter where your child is at. We are the ones that we need to cater for your own child. The same as the schools. The schools need to be ready to have your child doesn't mean that, that your child needs to be ready to go to school. Every child is different. Every one of us now is different. I have this much skills in IT. You might have this much skills in IT. I know two languages. You might, you might know three or five or even one language. So every one of us is different. So when we are at kinder, we 
we implement these strategies to enhance children's social skills, communications, language, independence, problem solving, routine and resilience through play-based. I'll give you a simple example that we all do at home. When you start cooking at home, you think, hmm, I'm going to cook some chicken and peas tonight for dinner and some rice. Hang on, I don't have chicken, so I need to go to the supermarket and I have some rice, but I don't have salt, so I need to add salt to my shopping list. And then you can ring your mom or your auntie or your uncle and say, by the way, I don't have enough salt. I couldn't find any, any in the supermarket. Can you bring me some, please? That's what your child is doing at kinder. When they play with each other, they work around what they have. So if they want to build a big tower using the wooden blocks, so they're going to think, how many blocks do I need? Where are the blocks? How can I get the blocks? How can I ask my friend to come and help me? But what if my friend doesn't want to help me? Can I go to my teacher and ask her for help? It's the same as your cooking experience at home. They do the same. We do our best to raise your child, to continue teaching your child to be a thinker. So when you think, you learn. But when you ask me, oh, where's the spoon? I was like, here's the spoon. You wouldn't have the ability to think, where would the spoon be? Oh, it, it can't be in the fridge. It can't be under the TV. It has to be in the drawer in the kitchen. So we, what we do at Kinder and what the school is doing as well, they try, we try our best to develop great thinkers, which means great learners. My advice to you is please talk and talk and talk and read and read and read to your child. If you're gonna go do some cooking, talk to your child. We're gonna go do some cooking now. Would you like to help me? Oh, can you get me this and this from the pantry? I wonder what we need next. I wonder how many cups of flour do we need? And then after the end, get your child to help you. Pack up, tidy up, set up the table for dinner. Get them to do the beds, get them to put their clothes by themselves because you're not gonna be always there for them. At school, it will be your child and 25 other children and one teacher. At kindergarten, it's your child and 29 other children with three teachers. So independence is the key here. For your child to be independent and to be able to ask for help when needed, that's learning. For your child to come and say, I'm really hurt. I don't know what to do. Can you help me, please? That's what we want. We want your child to be able to express their emotions, to be able to say, somebody hurt me. Can you come and help me? Or I don't know what to do. Or I'm really tired. I need to have a sleep. We know how to express our feelings because we taught ourselves. Back in the day, schools were different, as Rachel mentioned. Back in the day that you go to school, you sit down in the classroom, you listen to the teachers, you're not oh, yeah. allowed to open your mouth or discuss anything or even argue. Yeah. You just sit down, listen to the class, listen to the lesson, go home from four o'clock till 11 o'clock at night, you do your homework. That's the end of the story. Yeah. So play is the key here. And it's not about reading and writing. As Rachel mentioned, reading, and writing and learning all the academics will happen. But raising a healthy, happy, well-rested child, that means this child is a lifelong learner. We want the children to be able to build and continue building the life skills. When you go to the bank to, to get a check done, you wait in the line. You don't just jump in. So we teach the children they need to wait. There is no harm in saying to your child, no, you can't have the ice cream now. You're going to have the ice cream after dinner. There is no harm in doing that because everything in life is waiting 
turn taking, accepting others, accepting ourselves as well, and listening to others. And please, please praise your child. Get your child to believe in themselves. We were, I am not going to say we, because I don't know how you guys were brought up. The way I was brought up back in my home country, that parents don't praise the children. Parents always say, how come you didn't do that? When you get 9 out of 10, why did you get a 9 out of 10? Who got 10 out of 10? Who got, why? Do they have, do they have more brain than you? No. Praise your child. Build the confidence in your child that they can do it. They need to practice and practice and practice. It's like all of us. Did anyone in 2019 know something about Zoom? What was Zoom back then? Microsoft Teams, screen time, mute. What was that mute word? No one knew anything. Look at all of us now. We're all sitting in front of the screen talking and listening to each other. So we learned that. Like maybe I'm the oldest here, I'm 50 now, and I still, I'm still learning all of this stuff. So be confident that your child will do it. And when it comes to school or kindergarten, please, talk to the school and talk to the kindergarten. If there's something happening at home, if there is any changes happening at home, please tell us. If there is a problem, we will not be able to help you until you talk to us. And trust me, if we can't do it, if we can't help you, we're gonna ask for other, other person to help us like Dorian or Rachel or Di or Kat or Nazish. We're going to ring and say, we have this situation with this child and this family. We're not picking on you. We're here to help you. That's what we get paid for, to help you and to help your child. It's not just your child will stay with us for one year and then see you later. We don't want to know anything about you. No, it's a lifelong relationship between us and you and your child and the school as well. When it comes to getting your child ready to school, what we do at Kinder, we set up a school area. We have a school desk, we have blackboards, we have chalks, we have uniform, we have lunch boxes, we have school bags, we have, we have rulers, chalk, we have uh, rubbers, papers, pencils, all of that. When it comes to here at home, talk to your child at school. Take your child for a walk so they can see what the school looks like because the schools are huge buildings compared to kindergartens or long daycares. So take your child for a walk. Go on the school website and show your child pictures of the school on the website. Get your child to do drawing about what they think they might learn at school. The other thing about the lockdown that, as Rachel mentioned, the children don't learn only at kindergartens or schools. We said you are the first teachers. So your home is a classroom. Your home is a learning space for your child. So during the lockdown, your child stay longer with you at home. So they learned more from you. My last advice to you when it comes to getting your child to be a full round learner, read and talk and please, please minimize screen time as much as you can. When your child have the screen, because I've done it, I've done it with my son. And in this day and this age, the life is, is very, very quick. You finish work at six o'clock, you go home, you want to cook dinner, you want to get ready for the following morning, you want to put the children to bed, bath them, da, 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 da. So for you to have a peace of mind, you give your child, here's the phone. Just stay away from me. I need five minutes for myself. This screen is one-way relationship. Your child will not learn to talk to the screen. Your child will not learn how to solve a problem with the screen. Your child will not learn how to be independent, how to express their emotions, how to develop their language when they learn from a screen. Because the screen doesn't talk to them. The screen doesn't tell them, stop, don't hurt me. The screen doesn't tell them, oh, it's time to put your lunch away. No. And we always here for you. Dorian, as a 
preschool field officer, Rachel present the school, Da present the OT, the allied health, the kindergartens, the long day kids. We always here for you. Talk to us, please, if you have any concerns. And once again, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for giving me this chance. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maha. We can clearly see the passion and commitment that you have towards your job, just like other um, prep teachers or um, earlier professionals. So thank you so much for sharing all your insight with us today. So um, our next panel member is Diane Besser. Di is a pediatrician, a pediatric occupational therapist and team leader of Mary Kids Early Intervention Service at Mary Health. Uh, she has been working as an occupational therapist for more than 30 years. And for 20 years of that time, Di has specialized with children aged zero to six years with developmental delays, learning problems, autism spectrum disorder, and fine and gross motor issues. I would like to invite you um, to speak now, please, Di. Thank you so much for making time for this. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm a talker and that's a bit of a worry because it's now seven o'clock and we could be here till nine o'clock. So I'm going to cut it quite short. Um, the others have said pretty much a lot of the things that I wanted to say anyway. But can I just say to all the parents, like the first thousand days of your child's life is the most important period. And it's those days that are really preparing the child for school and what's to come um, from that point on. And I think that um, you know, if some of you come into the situation where you're advised to see a therapist, um, don't feel embarrassed about that. Don't feel like there's something wrong with your child. It's actually that what we're trying to do as therapists is to get your child to reach their maximum potential in whatever that may be. And whether they're going to be a genius heart surgeon or an astronaut or whether they're going to be a tradesperson um, or whatever they choose to do in the future in their life, to allow them to do that to the most, to the best of their potential. Um, and the therapist's role, so the therapists that I now um, manage, the so speech pathologists, physios, occupational therapists, really what we're about is trying to enhance things like the child's communication skills, um, get them involved in activities of daily living, like things like cooking, getting dressed, having their breakfast, having a shower, being independent, um, fine motor, things like uh, writing and colouring in and using scissors or gross motor areas like hopping, jumping, running, engaging in um, play skills. All of those areas are essential in, in terms of children being able to function well in the school environment. And children will do that at different levels of ability. And children will have a range of skills. So not many children have a presentation where they're equally good at all things all the time. So they will have things that they are really good at and things that they might need to be pulled up a little in. So that's where the therapists can really help you to um, enhance development in some areas. And I guess in terms of um, communication skills, the things I would say in terms of school preparedness is teach your children some really useful phrases. So a lot of people say things like, oh, my child's really clever because they can count to 100. It's not actually that functionally useful in terms of their everyday life. It's much more useful to teach them phrases like, can I play with you? Um, can, can I take my turn next? Um, really social phrases that are actually going to help them in that school environment rather than necessarily knowing colours, numbers, equations, whatever. Um, and their ability to follow directions and follow instructions, to wait, to listen, to take turns. And I could, I would encourage parents now, particularly with COVID restrictions and having more time as a family, play simple board games with them, really engage with them on that level. So it's teaching them skills like turn taking, waiting, listening, do things with them like simple cooking activities. Children can learn so much from a simple cooking activity. They can learn language skills, first, next, put it beside, put it under, put it on top of, even something simple like making a piece of toast. You can learn so many skills out of that task. Um, sequencing and planning a task. Um, read to them, spend time listening to their concerns, talk to them openly about school. And 
you know, believe that they can cope with that new adventure because that's what it is. It's an adventure. It's it's not necessarily a scary thing, even though I say this, when my children started school, they're now in their 20s, I wasn't allowed to take them to school because I was such an emotional wreck. So um, I think now if I had my time over, I would actually have prepared myself a little more for that situation. But you know, um, I think as Rachel said, leave quickly. You know, if you feel like that's going to be you, leave quickly. Um, because I think you can actually put a lot of stress on your children through your own anxiety. Um, so do the quick farewell and, and leave and go and have your cry in public, in private rather than in public. Um, and the other thing I would say, just in terms of their school readiness for in activities of daily living, make sure that they can actually unwrap their lunch if it's wrapped up in Glad Wrap. And maybe another idea, which is probably quite wasteful, is put it in foil so that they learn the art of an unwrapping, which is more easy, more easy, easier to unwrap than Glad Wrap. So, you know, give them structured tasks that will allow them to cope and succeed in some of those activities of daily living. And really encourage that independence. So even though they're very cute and that, you know, you love helping them to get dressed or you love helping them to do lots of activities, the more you can encourage that independence at an early age, the better off you will be and they will be. Um, so really, really encourage that independence. In terms of fine motor tasks, the thing I would say to you is don't expect them to just learn the art of writing overnight. For children, um, the art of writing is as complex as learning to drive for adults. So really give them time and space to learn that skill. And they don't have to be able to do that before they go to school. That's what teachers are for. So, you know, really it's a very structured activity which needs lots of skills at a base level before you go into that writing task. So don't push that before they're ready. The same as you wouldn't push them to walk before they were ready. Um, let these things develop in a sequence, which is, is the natural way. Um, and even things like gross motor tasks, like get them to practice sitting on the floor because sitting on the floor cross-legged is incredibly tiring for some children initially. So even little things like that, when they're maybe sitting and watching television or whatever, just get them to practice sitting cross-legged on the floor. Some kids can't even do that. They can't even cross their legs over. So teach them those sort of basic skills. Um, and it's just really practical stuff. So the other thing I would say about getting them ready for school, and I've provided this um, to the girls, but work on an all about me page. And, and whether this is used by the teachers when they get them into the classroom or not, it's a really lovely way of talking with your children about the sorts of things that they like, that they dislike. Ah, here it is on the screen. Um, and it's a really lovely conversation starter. So I like blah, 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 and get them to name this stuff, don't you? And it could be that they draw a picture. They might like donuts or get them to draw their representation of a donut. I am good at, it might be hopping, it might be um, playing PlayStation, whatever. But, you know, get them to represent that in their way. And you might need to put a word next to it for the teacher, but um, this stuff is really lovely conversation starters. I get worried about. Um, you know, sometimes we assume we know what our children will worry about, but to get it from their, from, um, yeah, from their own perspective is really important. Things that help me when I get upset, don't assume that all children love to be hugged or cuddled or consoled in a certain way. Some children like to be put in their own space and just have time out and they would find that much more uh, relaxing and um, consoling than being cuddled or held tightly. So it's important for the teachers and school staff to know this. I need help with. So children um, often, you know, maybe it's actually opening my drink bottle or taking my jumper off or whatever. But to have this information for the teachers, I think is a, is a really lovely resource. Things that help me to understand and learn that might be having a quiet space or um, not, not being put in a position where I get distracted by looking out the window to the playground. Uh, and please remember. So little things that the family might say, like this is a particular quirky um, part of my child, just 
this information sheet. It's one page, but it's a lovely talking point for children. So, you know, even for the parents to get to know your child better, this is a beautiful thing to work through. So I'd say, you know, try and prepare something like this. You know, you can put drawings on it. You can put, um, cut out pictures and put it on it, whatever. But, you know, during this period of COVID, I know it's really stressful for families, but see if you can really spend that quality time with children and give them your undivided attention, even just for sort of 10 minutes a day is just a, such a gift to be able to give them. Um, that's probably all I need to say. And thanks for the opportunity and enjoy the experience because it's very exciting. Thank you so much, Di, for those practical tips and strategies and for also sharing that resource. Um, it's looking great. I think it'll be quite helpful for lots of parents. Um, and next, I'm really excited to share that we've got a lovely local family here with us, Megan and Michael, along with their daughter, Freya. They're going to share their um, experience of starting school in 2021. So I'd like to invite them now. Um, thank you so much for making time for this tonight and for joining us. I could see Freya popping in and out um, of the screen earlier. Yeah, good day, everyone. I'm Michael and it's my partner, Megan. Hello. <laughs> um, just want to thank everyone for all your support. And it's great to know we have great minds and people behind our daughter's education. It's been a really good experience. Um, we have Freya was in kindergarten when COVID hit. And um, both Megan and I were uh, essential workers. So Freya was in daycare three days a week. She was pretty much the only one. Yeah, so there. she spent a lot of time with Jess. Her, At the, her, yeah, in her age group. That was at Community Kids. And um, so she was helping all the little ones. She was, yeah, with the feedback we got was <laughs> that she was helping all the little kids and she was a great asset for Jess. And helping the teacher. Yeah, learning how to fold tea towels and <laughs> the garden stuff and yeah and then um yeah then um where glenroy west has been fantastic the communication is on point like we've been really happy with the support and everything they've provided us for that transition um we haven't really got any negative um feedback about the school or, or that kind of transitional experience but we've been struggling with the homeschooling and and managing COVID this year as I'm no longer a permitted worker and uh, I've been at home with two girls, six and three for like three days a week, as well as trying to have nine hours like at, at, at my um, desk with, the, um, with my work as a project manager. So I have struggled with that. Um, not everyone's getting all the attention they deserve. And I found that I'm sort of pulled five different ways, but it's um, just one day at a time. and um reading eggs has been a great help um that was a good resource prior to freya starting school and we put our three-year-old onto it as well um that's, so that's her homework good. time um and in the kindergarten years megan was great at going to glenroy library and she'd borrow like way too many books that we could manage um that was all let them choose yeah the kids <laughs> got to choose um we read to freya like three to four books Thank a you. night um, wow. as we could. So, that was um, yeah, that's sort of been our experience. Um, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that, Michael and Megan. Um, what advice would you give parents who are starting school next year for their children? Um, not to worry too much. The, the, the school and the teachers have, have done it so many times year after year. They're, they've encountered so many different problems and issues and stuff that they just they just know how to make you feel comfortable and safe and your kids safe as well. So not to worry too much and just, yeah, like the other presenters have communicated, like reading to them heaps and just, just going through little, little practice sessions, whether they're wearing their school uniform down to the park or like or packing their lunch and unpacking it on a picnic just so they can hmm. sort of have that sort of prior experience. So just minimizing all the new sort of sounds and feelings that they're going to experience or, um, without their family around would sort of help. Freya was pretty excited though. Like she made a yeah. friend on orientation day and was, she was pretty excited. Yeah, she's good. So we were lucky like that. She wasn't nervous. I wasn't sure how she'd go because she'd had the same daycare friends since she was just over one. Hmm. So she transitioned pretty well, I thought. I was really surprised. And the before and after school care helped her kind of get to meet different yeah. kids from other classes as well. Kind of different ages, yeah. Mm. 
Yeah. That's great. Yeah, it's um each child is different, so you don't know how they will respond until they're there. But it's good that you had a good experience. Yeah. Um, so is Freya happy to talk to us as well, or yeah, I'll go get her. Yeah. a couple of questions for her if she's ready. Our guest of honor. <laughs> she's she's sometimes pretty shy. That's okay. She, it's a, it's it's completely fine if she's not um, up to uh, it at the moment. So that's not a yeah. problem. We just thought we'll hear from her how she likes the school and if she has any advice for our prep children. Uh, but um, thank you so much for your time, Mark. And yeah, you know, you're, you're very busy. You've taken time out for this. Really appreciate it. And you've also been waiting around with Freya for, for a while. Yeah, so. she's just feeling a bit shy. She might warm up to it. That's but, fine. Yeah, that's you. not a problem. You pretend you're just talking to Miss Marks. Just ignore all the other screens. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, your favourite teacher is here, Priya. I am noticing that, like, during COVID, she's become a bit more, even more shy and introverted, like, even towards our next door neighbour. And I thought, oh, this is something else I can speak. Because when we had a meeting with Miss Marks, that wasn't an issue at all about her being shy, but like talking to strangers. But mm. yeah, she's become. Yeah, we have missed that social interaction and yeah. building relationships with other parents and, and other kids in the class and stuff. We're really looking to build on that and yeah we started having a practice last night about how you should say how are you going <laughs> how are you <laughs> you have to go back to the basics don't be yeah i can i can actually relate to that i've got three skip children all school going children all quite old but still i feel like they're a little bit less social than before but i'm positive you know when things improve um they're pretty quick at learning so they'll be fine yeah. Uh, so thank you again uh, so much, Michael and Megan. Okay. I would like to hand it over to you, Kat, now to um, run us through the questions and answers session and part of this. Yeah, so we've already had some um, questions and answers come up in the chat, but we might see if we can just get um, a couple more out quickly before we end the session. Um, I know Dorian's put a couple of answers in already, um, but Someone said that lots of the presenters have said around school needs to be ready for the child, um, not that the child needs to be ready for school, but schools are all so different. So how do you pick a school um, and find the right one for you? I'm wondering, Dorianne, whether that might be a good one for you. Thanks, Kat. Um, and I was going to answer that one, but I thought I've, the answer is so long, I might give, wait for the opportunity to, to say it out loud. I think when it comes to choosing a school, it's really about going with what values um, match your family's values. When it comes to um, identifying if a, child, if a school is ready for your child, there are lots of great um, things in place, things like this transition network that I mentioned earlier, where you know that teachers from kindergarten and primary school are communicating and engaging with each other and building rapport and supporting um, to tailor a child's transition to school, as well as the transition learning and development statements. Um, I didn't say that right, Maha, what's it called again? It is transition learning and development statements, isn't it? I haven't done one for a while, so yeah. So the transition learning and development statements are statements that kindergarten teachers write for every child that's transitioning to school and they give them, parents have a part, you've probably already been approached by your child's kindergarten to have a part in that um, because parents as partners, um, you know, as Rachel mentioned, you are your child's first teacher and then there's a the kindergarten teacher and then the primary school and what better people to work together to really support a positive transition. So those transition statements are quite valuable. So I would even encourage you to, when you're meeting your child's prep teacher, ask them, have you read the transition learning and development statement that my child's kindergarten teacher has put together? Because there's some really valuable information in those statements that support the school to be ready for your child. Tips and tricks, probably not tricks, but a few tips from the, um, your child's kindergarten teacher that helps um, the prep teacher and the foundations teacher, sorry, I haven't got my head around foundation yet, I still use prep, but to help the foundation teacher know what strategies work for your child, perhaps when they are in a conflict situation, or know what strategies work really well for your child when you're trying to extend and develop on their learning and their love of books or um, their love of construction, for example. So I really encourage you to um, 
promote those transition learning and development statements with the primary school and also um, rest assured knowing that behind the scenes teachers are also connecting and building on relationships to support those transitions and to support the schools um, to be ready for your child. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dorianne. Um, I can see that Seema has their hand up if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question and maybe Hi. say who it's for. Yes, hello. Um, I'm actually not sure who to direct it to, but I'm, I can ask the question and then take it from there if you like. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I've got a question around school readiness um, and age. Um, I have got twins um, who are the youngest um, in their kinder group currently. Um, so they would have only turned five after starting school um, and English to them has been a second language um, as we've been focusing on their mother language at home. So it's something they're still developing. Um, their kinder teacher has given us the okay for them, you know, starting school, but it's also um, sort of recommended a bonus here based on their age. Um, so my question was, um, can the age, so, sort of the, can the younger age bracket, I guess, compared to their peers, um, especially if there are repeating children from kinder or prep due to, you know, all these COVID lockdowns, um, can it be a hindrance to their success in school or will a bonus year of kinder and starting school, I guess, in an older age bracket be an advantage in their overall schooling? Thank you. I'm happy to take it. I'm unmuted already, but I'm happy for someone else to take that if you want. Di, I'm, you I'm happy to yourself? add something. Go, look, go for look, it. I actually think that it's much better for children to be over ready than under ready, because I think that if you look forward, you're at school for a very long time to come. So I would not be in any rush to push kids um, to school. And it's not really about their academic um, ability to cope. It's really much more about social emotional. So I would be guided very much by the um, kinder teacher, but have, you know, that sounds like they've um, already addressed potentially them doing a second year. Um, so I would err on the side of caution if that's the case. And I think there's no downside to children being over ready when you actually see children that have done a second year of kinder and they are so ready to go to school and they can learn so much. People say, oh, will they be bored? But they can learn so much in that year because they've already got the foundation skills and they can be the helpers. They can be, um, you know, be given so many great roles um, that further enhances their development and just makes them more confident for the time when they do start. I might just add as well, if you have got a little person in your family that does fall under that sort of younger age bracket between December and April, before they even start kindergarten, it might be worth considering, should we defer their entry into three-year-old, for example? So in three-year-old kinder, they're studying as a four-year-old. And then when they get to four-year-old, they'll be turning five at the beginning of the four-year-old kinder year. And, and this just supports, again, like Di said, that sort of being over ready and having the opportunity to um, defer their entry into school. There is opportunity to have a second year of kindergarten, of course, um, but there is a criteria link to that. So if you sort of just think, what's the hurry? Um, as Kathy Walker used to, one of her, her book mentions, what's the hurry? If you think you're happy for your child to have um, a slower entry into school, consider deferring um, their entry into three-year-old kinder and then deferring their entry into four-year-old kinder if you've got younger children in your family. Thanks, Dorianne. Um, I think that's largely the questions that we've had in come through in the chat, which is perfect timing because we've come to um, nearly 7.30. Thank you everyone for your feedback and for coming along tonight. It's been so great to have your questions and to have you sitting there listening. And thank you again to Dorianne, to Rachel, to Maha, to Di and to Megan, Michael and Freya who shared their stories as well. Um, after this, we're gonna be sending out an email to everyone who registered that has some links that were shared in the chat, some of the um, resources that were mentioned, such as the one that Di shared, the All About Me um, poster. And we've also got a um, newsletter that you can subscribe to. I think Nazish is gonna put the link in the chat as well. Um, 
but we've also, um, yeah, then you'll have our contact details. So if there's anything else that you need or if you want to be involved in Ready, Set, Prep at all, um, please get in touch with us. Um, we really love meeting everyone and it's been so great tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone.